I'm very glad to have on the podcast for the first time, Ken Klipperstein, who is the national security reporter for The Intercept, previously the nation's DC correspondent. Welcome, Ken. Good to be with you. And returning to the podcast for the upteenth time, the journalist whose coverage I would be lost without, founder of The Daily Poster, and Oscar-nominated screenwriter, David Sirota. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. We are here to t- today to talk about uh, an aspect of the Ukraine conflict that's a little bit attenuated from it. Um, we dove in last week, and I want to broaden us out a little bit. And what made me want to talk about the subject is that you, Ken, wrote an article last week in The Intercept called Saudi Russia Collusion is Driving Up Gas Prices and Worsening the Ukraine Crisis. And over the Daily Poster, David, you have done some coverage of how energy lobbyists are trying to exploit this moment. Uh, So I wanted to have this conversation about what the energy sector means for the uh, implies for this broader uh, crisis. I want to start with you, Ken. Can you give us some background about the U.S.-Saudi oil relationship and what's now happening with the uh, intervention of Russia into Ukraine? Yeah. So as I reported in the story, in about 2015, MBS, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince and de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, started establishing a relationship with Vladimir Putin in which he uh, traveled to Russia. I'm told by uh, people that had direct knowledge of this at the time, that he wanted an audience with President Obama, because at the time he was still deputy crown prince. And he was trying to, um, for a, you know, ruler in a, in a uh, monarchic society like that, a kingdom, um, your image matters a lot, seeming like you have legitimacy matters. And one of the ways that you can do that is by having a leader of a powerful country like the US come and meet with you. Um, My understanding is that Obama declined to do that. And as a consequence of that, MBS got really angry. And he said, well, you know what, I'm just going to meet with uh, Putin, then he'll meet with me. And so um, he ended up on the sidelines of a uh, economic summit uh, meeting with him. And my understanding is that from there, the relationship blossomed as it did with uh, President Trump, had the closest relationship with Saudi Arabia of any president. And I think in U.S. history, made his first foreign visit to Riyadh, which no president had ever done. Every other president in uh, the tradition is to go to either Mexico or Canada, neighboring countries. Um, He went to Riyadh, uh, inked almost immediately uh, the biggest weapons deal in U.S. history to sell to them. And um, on two occasions uh, in election years, as we're in now, in 2018 and 2020, uh, was able to get the Saudis to increase production in the case of 2018 uh, to to buoy the economic um, situation in the U.S., and then to decrease production to protect the uh, domestic shale industry and please his donors and again in 2020. Now, uh, with Biden in office in 2021, uh, He's asked repeatedly the Saudis to do uh, what they did for President Trump, and they have declined to do so. They declined to increase um, oil production, which would have the effect of driving down gas prices, which are now at a ten-year or seven-year high, um, and are you know um, by any stretch of the imagination going to have some kind of effect electorally. And my understanding from people, uh, certainly on the national security side of things, is that there's a lot of concerns about that, and they don't know what they're going to do. Um, so really, I think that this oil-based system is not just a gift to the Russians. It's a gift to the Republicans. It's a gift to the Saudis. It gives them geopolitical clout of a sort that they wouldn't enjoy if we had managed to uh, transition our uh, economy away from fossil fuels and towards uh, renewable energy. So what's your understanding of why it is that MBS is, l- is less willing to kind of play ball with Biden as compared to Donald Trump? Well, so um, Biden refused to meet with him. And if you talk to folks both in the national security world and in the human rights world, a lot of them are very critical of Biden. So I'm not by any means saying that he's you know, um, done it, done done sufficient to hold him to account for not just the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, a Washington Post reporter, but uh, you know any number of human rights violations, like um, you know jailing and torturing women involved in um, women's rights demonstrations, things of that. I mean, I could go on and on. Um, but one thing that he did do was decline to meet with MBS. Instead, meets with the uh, king, King Salman, and as a consequence of that, MBS uh, and I, you know, any number of folks in the intelligence community will tell you this. Um, is extremely angry, and there's a very, you know, rancorous and uh, toxic relationship um, because of that. And um, as a cons- and and you know, I can't read MBS's mind, but my understanding is that he's very upset about it. He makes that clear to people in his circle, and um, it you know, it seems like that, you know, that would play a major role in in why they've declined to to um, grant this to the U.S., which historically they've done. I worked with the U.S. on production questions. And so um, I should note, too, that in 2016, 
Um, Russia, for the first time, was invited into OPEC, and now it's called OPEC Plus. And so what that allows them to do is coordinate production decisions so that they can have um, uh, control, better control over the value of gas, the value of oil, um, and the, I, I think the, the geopolitical ramifications of that we're seeing right now, which is that they're having extraordinary profits at a time that Putin has uh, invaded Ukraine and is uh, going to be hurting from uh, the sanctions that have been applied and is able to offset that with, the, with this bonanza of profits that they're having by, by withholding production as much as they had, because that has the effect of raising, raising costs, raising prices. Yeah, the, the red flag went off in all of this very early, it seemed. When in some of the initial remarks that Biden gave last week pertaining to Ukraine, he flagged, one, that Americans might have to tighten their belts and that to protect our allies, they were going to face high prices at the pump, but this was kind of our national obligation. Um, And two, the reporting on the fact that although America was going to respond with sanctions, those sanctions would be tailored in a way that tried to avoid impacting the energy sector, despite the fact that some substantial portion of Russia's GDP is driven by its oil profits, and there seems to be a natural tension there. What do you make, and I'll I'll go to you for this, Sirota, of that tension and the way that, you know, kind of our solidarity strings are being pulled on by saying we're going to we're, we're going to hit hit them back hard we're going to sanction them into oblivion but there are all these carve outs not just in the energy energy sector but as you've reported um to avoid certain other interests that benefit the west there's a way to make sure that sanctions are as targeted as possible uh, and the the difficulty is is that to make them as targeted as possible would require a political leadership was willing to break with its financial industry donors. We've been reporting on how there's all this talk in the air right now about going after Russian oligarchs. Uh, mm-hmm. It's become the, the, the talking point of the day to the point where uh, Joe Biden is talking about it in his uh, State of the Union address. The problem is, is that Wall Street uh, and corporate America writ large, really for decades, has worked very hard to keep the US and uh, British financial systems completely and totally opaque. The problem then is that you can say we're going to target this or that Russian oligarch or Vladimir Putin's personal uh, assets, but if you can't find out where those assets actually are, then the sanctions are nice on paper, the rhetoric is great, but you you may not be actually inflicting the kind of pain and deterrence that you're trying to inflict. Uh, we reported on how even in the lead up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as tensions were heightening, you had all sorts of financial industry and corporate lobbyists pushing the Biden administration uh, to essentially water down an already watered down corporate transparency law that all it does is create a database to let law enforcement officials and regulators know who the owners of shell companies are. Now, Mm -hmm. you can understand why that's necessary. If you can't know the owners of shell companies, uh, LLCs and the like, then you don't know which or whatever kind of LLCs and corporations in our financial system are actually the, the beneficiaries are Russian oligarchs and Vladimir Putin's financial network. Uh, You also have a situation where Barack Obama, towards the end of his uh, presidential uh, tenure, put forward a rule simply extending something called the Bank Secrecy Act to the private funds industry, private equity, hedge funds, all sorts of opaque uh, investment vehicles that have grown exponentially uh, on Wall Street. Obama used existing executive authority to propose that. Uh, His tenure ran out before it could be Uh, put in place. Wall Street pushed against it. Donald Trump dropped it. Joe Biden, even now, has refused to use his executive authority to put that Obama proposed rule in place. And again, that is a rule to simply say that private equity, real estate funds, hedge funds, all of the uh, asset vehicles that we know Russian oligarchs are in, to say that they have to comply with the same basic transparency rules that Fortune 500 companies and other kinds of companies uh, have to comply with. Point being here is that Wall Street's supremacy in American politics, purchased through campaign contributions, an army of lobbyists, Wall Street's supremacy has actually made it harder 
to enforce sanctions on the very people that are being talked about as needing to face sanctions. And you don't have to believe me on that. Right? The, the, this situation has developed, even though in 2020, the FBI itself issued a warning saying these opaque vehicles and the opacity of the financial system itself has created a problem of allowing people targeted by sanctions to avoid and evade those sanctions. Yeah, I, I got to say, when I was first reading the reporting, um, not just about the kind of selective sanctions, but the hesitation to to stop the gas line to Germany and and the the way it was very clear early on that financial interests were militating against the full force of a hammer being brought down in 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 tension with the rhetoric about how uh, the enormity the severity of the invasion my initial instinct was to say okay well all of this world war 3 nuclear war stuff can't be so proximate cuz you know, we wouldn't let ourselves, we, we would we would at least try to exhaust all of these measures. And if we're still pussyfooting around the idea of protecting profit makers, if we're still pussyfooting around the idea of protecting corporations, then then we can't be that close to pressing the big red button. But then this other part of my brain perks up and goes, well, there there is another very cynical reading of this that could say we would rather go head to head into nuclear conflict or into, into direct conflict with a nuclear, uh, nuclear armed country then actually suffer consequences on the balance sheets of a number of corporations. Yeah, I mean, I would I would put it this way. I think there's something in between those, which mm -hmm. is to say that doing what's necessary to do, for instance, to make the financial system more transparent, to then really go after Russian oligarchs, that what can be done and what should be done is so beyond the realm of possibility and thinking among people caught in a Wall Street moneyed bubble in Washington, people immersed in Wall Street propaganda about how this couldn't possibly be done, that it's not even considered a policy tool. It's not even considered a policy alternative, even though, by the way, other industrialized countries uh, do this all the time. Now, we happen to be the biggest uh, or one of the biggest financial systems in the world, which, of course, and also one of the most opaque, which is why what we do at the, at the regulatory level is so important. But my point is, is that it's not even something it, it seems like it's not even something in the range of possibility. I mean, think about the story that we we broke open today, which is that literally the Biden administration is proposing to waive punishments for a convicted bank, Credit Suisse. It's proposing to waive punishments uh, to allow the bank to continue managing lots and lots of American retirees' money, even as there are revelations happening right now about Credit Suisse's shady connections to all sorts of autocrats uh, and oligarchs, including some Russian oligarchs. I mean, the story today that we broke that story about how the Biden administration is pushing that, at the same time, the Financial Times reported that Credit Suisse has asked its investors and its, its counterparties to destroy documents related to the loans that it gives out and the financing that it gives out to oligarchs for their yachts and jets. Mm. And yet the Biden administration continues to push forward for a waiver of these punishments for Credit Suisse's misbehavior. Not surprisingly, donors from Credit Suisse gave Joe Biden's campaign $100,000. Now, I think there's a chance that that decision to waive those punishments may, uh, there's a chance that that decision may be withdrawn. But the point is, that shows you how captured American politics is, where, where these things are happening in tandem. Politicians are going, running out, so we're going to get tough on, on oligarchs, we're going to get tough on financial networks that are supporting those oligarchs. Meanwhile, in the gears of government, Things like a waiver for one of the banks at the center of the of the problem is just sort of just sort of moves forward as if nothing's going on at all. Yeah, I mean, and I want to come back uh, to some of the lobbying efforts that you've covered as well from the American Petroleum Institute, uh, David. But first, I want to go back to Ken and ask him about some of these uh, geopolitical circumstances, because I will confess ignorance about a lot of this. And I'm reading about OPEC, OPEC plus. And, you know, what we're talking about here is a cartel and an and oil fixing, a oil price fixing cartel of countries that's, you know, going back and forth about whether or not to let Russia in the mix. 
we're talking about, um, you know, Russia being the third, the world's third largest oil producer with 12 percent of global output, the second largest gas p- uh, producer with 17 percent of output. Europe gets 70 percent of its gas from Russia and 50 percent of its oil from Russia. And so when we're talking about the ability of Russia and Saudi Arabia to draw close to each other and control prices at the same time that has these direct political effects to Joe Biden. We're also talking about Europe in winter that is already facing upwards of 50, you know, 50% increases in prices of fossil fuels to heat their homes and at the pumps and, and things like that. And it is fascinating. I was I was listening to a um a, a scholar give a lecture at the University of Chicago from back in 2015. And he was talking about these broader trends and the and the danger of what it would mean for the U.S. to increasingly escalate with Russia in a way that pushed it into these alliances with China that enabled it, incentivized it to go ahead and be able to participate in these kind of price controls that protect Russia from sanctions the way that we're describing and also allow it to have more flexibility because of these other kinds of alignments. And I wonder what you make of um kind of the country's choice, America's choice to kind of have this posture where because of Russia and because of Russiagate and Hillary Clinton's emails and all of these things, there has been very little discussion about these kind of broader global trends and alliances that are emerging now and their effects on an, uh, on a moment like we're experiencing now with Ukraine. Yeah, I find that in the mainstream discourse in the mainstream press, they don't like to talk about these kind of questions because it lays bare some ugly realities, which is that um, for expedience sake, all of the rhetoric about human rights is discarded um, when you have a resource as important as oil. Uh, you look at Saudi Arabia and its human rights record. It's got one of the you know most gruesome records in the modern world for you know Washington to 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 have the relationship that we have with them, they don't want that out. They don't want people thinking about that talk. It's going to undercut all of the critiques that we have to make about um, our adversary countries because it's exposing that you know we don't apply those standards to our our, our country's relationships and its al- and its uh, and its uh, partnerships. But also just that if people found out about it, I think they'd be disgusted and want to change the nature of the relationship and what effect that's going to have. That would have. Uh, would be to put pressure on the oil system of which not just the Saudis are dependent, but an entire economic system in in not just the U.S., but the West is dependent. And so I think they have to protect that. And for that reason, a lot of this stuff is just memory old and it's not discussed because the conclusions that people will come to are the wrong ones from the perspective of um, that, that, you know, petro system that I was describing a moment ago. Well, let's talk about some of the conclusions that are being drawn in the mainstream media. I want to play you guys some clips uh, of how this is being covered right now. In 2021, when Biden came in, he's the one who made Russia the top source of gasoline and refined petroleum for the United States. Biden did that. Biden's the one who shut down the Keystone Pipeline. Biden's the one who now is pushing us toward this green energy nonsense because, and it's not nonsense, a good thing. I hope it comes, it'll be great. But on the (laughs) the other hand, he's he's beholding to AOC and the left-wing Marxist progress Aggressives. And in the end, he wants us all in electric cars so that we can then be reliant on China and the lithium batteries. Don't you see? They push us toward these people. The doomsday scenario is that instead of being reliant on Russia, which, which you know, Russia bad, or Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia bad, it's just infinitely worse to be reliant on China and lithium batteries, China bad, Green New Deal, kind of good. That was, I was surprised about that little interjection. What do you make of this? I want to live in the reality in which she's living, where there's all this <laughs> impending green energy. Because if you look at the legislation, um, obviously, you know, Build Back Better is 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 in suspended animation now. But there are components of it um, relevant to electric vehicles and uh, alternatives that um, Manchin himself has expressed support for. And w- what happened to it? Where is it? I haven't seen any effort on the part of the White House to try to pursue this stuff, even though, again, this was a portion of the legislation that Manchin specifically said he was open to, uh, uh, you know, whereas he was critical of a whole lot of other things. So I don't, I, I mean, the again, I want to live in the universe that she's living in. Yeah, what's I mean, funny I mean, can is, I just, can I just yeah, make go a ahead. point? I mean, there, yeah. There's something that's so kind of apocalyptic about this in this way. The argument from Manchin to that clip that you just saw is essentially that we have to 
make alliance with climate change in order to defeat the Russians. In other words, we have to literally incinerate the what's left of the livable ecosystem in order to fight the Russians. And just stepping back and thinking about how dark a vision that is, I mean, that is a really incredibly dark vision. Obviously, in the short term, we have problems with a fossil fuel-based economy, uh, so does Europe, uh, and its ties to a major fossil fuel producer, uh, the Russians. But the idea that the Green New Deal, which is still just basically a concept, or even the climate provisions of the Build Back Better bill, uh, are, which are pretty, frankly, in my view, pretty, pretty meager. Mm -hmm. they're just meager, right? The idea that that is the problem and not the fact that we've constructed knowing uh, an economy based, built on fossil fuels that are both destroying the livable ecosystem and tying us to petrol states. Uh, it's just, it's, I mean, it, this is where we are. And, and frankly, I get, having made, participated in making the movie Don't Look Up, uh, which I think you can see my depression in some ways and my despondence on screen. It's like, how are we ever going to get to anything rational if that's the state of the discourse right now? Yeah, I want to I want to play the next clip in that queue, Ben, because it, there is a there is a don't look up tie in that I, I want you to read on, David. OK, Wall Street Journal, a commentary piece, the headline, how to beat Putin with natural gas. I know you think that the energy sector is a big part of this. In 1948, American supplies broke the Russian stranglehold on Berlin. Today, American energy can end Berlin's dependence on Russia. If plane loads of food can get the better of Stalin, boatloads of gas can get the better of Mr. Putin. So how do we convince? our European allies and others to wean themselves off of that dependence on Russia? Sure, there are three things that the president should do immediately with respect to American energy, and, and we need to get back to energy independence. Number one, he's got to announce that the Keystone XL pipeline is, is back in business, and uh, let's get that finished. And what I've said is call it the Biden Build Back Better pipeline, take credit for the jobs, take credit for doing it, take credit for the fact that the, the fuel that comes there will be processed in, in clean American refineries and not dirty Chinese refineries, and take a win. It's good for America, and uh, let's do that, Mr. President. Number two, we've got to get the leases of, uh, at least announce that, that we'll re renew the leases for uh, drilling on federal land and, and send the message. It'll take some time for the drilling to take place, but send the message to the oil markets that, that we're back in business for oil drilling on federal lands, uh, not on Yellowstone and not in national parks, but in, in places where it would be safe and, and efficient and, and clean. And number three, he had a flight to Texas and, and talked to our friends in the oil and gas industry there. There's a lot of capacity that we, we have already that we don't need new leases or new pipelines, but we need the oil companies to start drilling again and ask them as their patriotic duty to to invest the capital and start drilling and start pumping that oil and gas out uh, on the on the oil uh, re reserves that we already have, and those three things would would immediately stabilize the markets and send a, a message to the, uh, the the Europeans. But it would also the hundred dollar barrel uh, a gal mm -hmm. a barrel of oil is, is bad for American consumers, but it's putting a fortune in Putin's pocket. He's making more money off the rising oil price than he's losing on the sanctions. And so it, we, we'd have the double whammy of helping American consumers and hurting Putin. OK, everything you just outlined is antithetical to what this administration, this president has done so far. So on the off chance they're watching tonight, how would you convince him that this is actually in his best interest or in America's uh, more importantly, best interest uh, to make those moves? Well, well, President Biden's a patriot, and he's a, you know he's got to go back to being the old Scranton Joe and, and looking out for the working man and, and working woman in this country. And he's also an Atlanticist. He wants to see our alliances do well in Europe, and, and we've got to make that a priority. And, and he's been taken hostage by the, the progressives and the squad and the green energy folks. And we all want green energy, and it's going to take some time for us to get there. But right now, we're facing a national emergency. We've got it the first time since 1938 a European country being taken by conquest by its neighbor. And so let's get the oil and gas going. Let's get the bridge to the green energy and let's make it a bipartisan win for the American people. And and, and I think that's something that Joe Biden would, uh, President Biden would be uh, uh, well thought of for doing. All right, David, I, I, I heard that and I heard, I'm here for the jobs the asteroid will provide. I, I mean, I, I just, I, I can't, I'm sort of, I'm usually, I usually, I'm not a law, at a loss for words, but that, that was so, I mean, I didn't mean to traumatize you, David. I mean, that was really like you could have put that in the movie. Like you could have just splice that into the movie. Like just splice, like just splice it right in there. I mean, this is the same week 
that the UN scientists are basically like, we're all going to die unless we change course immediately, if not yesterday. And yet this is what is being pumped out. This is the bilge being pumped out into uh, the American discourse about how uh, let's double down uh, on, on drilling, let's double down on fossil fuels. I, a more rational conversation would be this, to stipulate that yes, in the very short term, we remain a fossil fuel-based economy and we have to do what's necessary to mitigate the pain uh, for uh, vast numbers of working people in this country, mitigate the pain uh, that price spikes and uh, volatility in that fossil fuel economy uh, will will experience in light of this conflict. I'm willing to like stipulate that that's a challenge. That is a short-term challenge. By the way, it's been a short-term challenge for the long term going back. We should have been able to figure out how to do this. This is why we should have started d- dealing with uh, clean energy, you know, decades ago, but that's another I mean, topic. I mean, that, 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 that is the thing, right? Because to, you know, Ken's article in that reporting, the last time we dealt with an inflate a real oil gas spike inflation moment the moment that co- that springs to mind every time an american hears the word inflation was the 1970s which was similarly rooted in a geopolitical crisis but was attributed to these kind of economic vagaries and and fiscal policies domestically and at that moment someone could have made the decision we don't want to be um tied up or they, we don't want tried. to be i mean i'm not saying jimmy carter was an it was a enormous hero on this stuff but he was a forward thinking president you can look at the i mean there was gus speth's book uh, uh they knew and it's a detail of what the government knew back then and what the carter administration was trying to do and here's the thing the carter administration was ridiculed for pushing uh, trying to push the country towards things like conservation, uh, towards things like green energy. Uh, Ronald Reagan made a big thing about, you know, I'm taking the solar panels off the White House. Uh, uh, the media made a whole thing about Jimmy Carter and his sweater, and he was pushing conservation. And he was ridiculed for it. And the, and so th- the history seems to be repeating, right? I mean, you've got, yes. you just showed a Fox News clip of Fox News essentially ridiculing the idea, using the short-term crisis, of the fossil fuel economy to ridicule the idea of changing the fossil fuel economy, essentially departing from the fossil fuel economy. And so history is really repeating itself. And of course, they found a convenient scapegoat. Uh, you've heard all those terms, green, you know, the Green New Deal has become a, you know, this, this epithet. The squad has become this epithet. Uh, it's, it's, it's frankly, it's really disheartening. And you're right, it brings up that scene uh, from the movie Don't Look Up. Uh, we, we believe in the jobs were for the jobs that the comet would provide, which, of yeah. course, that what's what I find funny and horrifying about that whole scene is that the jobs that the comet may provide are, I guess, are kind of cool, but it's still a comet, right? right? Like it's, it's going like, to kill you, and it's, it's almost gonna... worse because in this moment, this could be a time where progressives use the fact that we are vulnerable geopolitically because of our reliance on yes, foreign the oil. Moment. Yes, to push to push the Green New Deal and progressive climate policy. But we're recording a day out from the State of the Union. We didn't really hear much of that in the progressive response to Joe Biden. I want to ask you, I know, David, you have to go a little earlier, to weigh in on what you made of um, uh, Rashida Tlaib's response uh, to Joe Biden last night. You know, I, I think in general that there needed to be a response because I think there was so much left out of that speech. I mean, you you highlighted the fact that Biden, I think, barely mentioned climate change. Biden talked a lot about uh, austerity. I mean, this shift to budget deficits and, and that kind of theme. By the way, a reversion to where he has been as a politician for 40, 50 years, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, and to be clear, I was somebody who uh, applauded and was supportive of the fact that in the beginning of his presidency, he seemed to discard that with the American Rescue Plan, and he seemed to be willing uh, to really make big investments in the country. But we've now seen the Build Back Better bill go from six trillion to four trillion to three trillion to one point eight trillion to now. I don't even. I mean, I, I keep making the joke on social media. We're gonna, we're headed towards uh, trains, planes, and automobiles, where it's going to be two bucks and a Casio uh, by the time <laughs> that this is over, right. So my, I guess my my point is, I'm glad to see that there was a response. Uh, laying out uh, different 
a different vision uh, and a critique. I know there was this, you know, there's this whole dialogue about how, oh, it's horrible that Rashida Tlaib is is responding to the to the State of the Union, or and then Josh Gottheimer, the conservative Democrat, he was responding with somehow that wasn't a big deal, but Rashida Tlaib doing it. I mean, I think the takeaway here is that we're seeing a very coordinated, very well engineered effort to take a, frankly, if we're being really honest about it, a relatively powerless American left right now mm. uh, with, and, and take that American left and scapegoat it in a kind of unbelievably disproportionate way. In other words, it's not just that the criticism of the squad or the left or whoever is, is just wrong on the merits, right? It, it is wrong so on the policy merits, but it's so wildly dishonest and disproportionate vis-a-vis how much power the left actually has, especially at a time when we're seeing what power looks like when it is wielded by uh, by individual legislators. In other words, you, you can blame the squad all you want, but as far as I'm concerned, the squad hasn't really gotten in the way of much of anything. And I've been critical of them not getting in the way of right. certain things. Meanwhile, you got Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Cinema running around singularly holding up everything. Now, uh, to be clear, I actually don't think they're singular. I think they represent a cadre. But the point is, is that to look at that situation and then say, oh, the the problem is this handful of legislators here on the left who haven't gotten in the way of anything is just it's just ridiculous. It's it's, it's obviously coordinated. I want I want to ask, though, because I I wanted to ask what both of you think about this, because I was watching um, Rashida's response and I was thinking, I fully support the idea of this response, right? I'm old enough to remember when Stacey Abrams did a response to Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders did a response after that and everyone said that that was doing a racism. So I'm fully supportive of anybody and everyone wanting to do a response. I think it's ridiculous that people make some of these media narratives out of it. But I was asking myself the question, what is the purpose of this response? What is this doing? And there was one part of it that actually made me a little bit hopeful as a leftist. I want us to imagine, just imagine a government where corporate donors don't drive health care, climate, education, and poverty policies, where the working families of our nation really call the shots. It's time. It's time we had a majority in Congress to fight for us, a working families majority. No matter who you are, or where you're from, most of us want the same things, a good paying job, a safe community, clean air and water, good schools, and a brighter future for our families enough to thrive, not just survive. So what would a working families majority do? We'd work with President Biden to deliver for you and your family. We'd guarantee healthcare as a basic right, because after two years of this pandemic, we can allow corporate profits determine, to determine who lives and who dies. We'd stand up to big pharma and insurance companies and we'd make drug prices for life-saving medicine like insulin actually affordable. So I heard that, and a part of my brain said, oh, is she setting up the parameters for a truly progressive voting bloc that will vote as a bloc unlike the Progressive Caucus, and perhaps even setting the stage for a dirty break of the sorts that a lot of progressives who have been excited about the prospect of third-party runs are agitating for? Am I, am I being overly optimistic and trying to read something in to her framing a working family party ticket in that very distinctive way that I haven't heard them do before? You know, I, I call me old and cynical, but I, I think <laughs> that, um, look, the Democratic voting electorate is a much more top down party focused, party unity focused electorate. It is a fundamental challenge uh, to push the party to be better without violating this unwritten code of loyalty. It is a problem that Bernie Sanders faced. It is a problem that the squad faces. It's a problem that any group's trying to work in and around the Democratic Party. And of course, then the other side is like a third party. The problem with that is that, you know, you're essentially locked out of, quote unquote, the game. Now, the game is rigged. So it's this constant, I think, quandary about what to actually do. But but what this would be, though, David, is her saying you should elect Democrats on the working family party's line. You should focus focus on that 
on that ballot line because this this word, Working Families Party, that phrase, that grouping is going to denote a certain policy prescription and perhaps a willingness to vote in these block-like adversarial ways that a lot of progressives have been criticized this year for not doing. So here's how old I am. I'm so old that I that my second of three books included an entire chapter on the Working Families Party mm-hmm. and on the theory of the Working Families Party, which I very much am intrigued by and I think I am supportive of in the sense of using a ballot line where a ballot line is legal and, and permitted, right? There's only a couple of states where you can have a, it's called fusion voting, where, where one party's ballot line can list candidates from another party on it. Uh, that, that that in New York for a long time had created, and, and if, I mean, as an example, if you want to understand how New York finally broke pieces of its democratic machine, that process is not over, but started to break it, right, in these elections of progressives uh, and socialists and the like to the, to the state legislature, uh, that was a lot of work for years and years and years by the Working Families Party to get people to vote on that line. I, I think that is a hugely powerful tool. Here's the problem. The problem is only, it, it's not a problem with the theory, that's the problem with what's, what's allowed and what's not allowed. And not to bore you with the history, but about 125 years ago, fusion voting was the way everybody voted. Small parties, medium-sized parties could fuse with other parties so that you could have a farmer's party uh, voting for Democratic candidates or the Labor Party vote, you know, listing. Uh, and it, it was so powerful. It was working so well that the Carl Rove of the era, a guy named Mark Hanna from Ohio, spearheaded a campaign to get it outlawed in state after state after state, because what they understood was it was creating a way for working people to come together uh, across cultural and geographic lines uh, in support of a common shared economic agenda. So all of that's to say is in the states where fusion voting, working families, party ballot lines are allowed, it is a hugely important tool. The, the trouble is, is to try to get it legalized elsewhere. And guess who doesn't want it to be legalized elsewhere? The two parties. The two right. major parties don't want it to be legalized. And so that's the, that's the problem. Right. So uh, completely understanding the problem, I guess my question is whether you think that her framing that way is signaling to a lot of progressives who have been talking about fusion voting and advocating for fusion voting and in in furtherance of their support of third party efforts, you know, signaling to that group that this is something that the progressives in Congress, at least some progressives have been thinking about. Another thing that raised a flag for me was Pramila Jayapal's response when asked by Mehdi Hassan about uh, Rashida's Speech. I want to ask you about Congresswoman Rashida Taleb, squad member, who's planning on giving the progressive response to Joe Biden's State of the Union speech. What do you say to more centrist critics from within your party who say that's a divisive move? Well, that is from the Working Families Party. That is not a a progressive caucus response. Um, And of course, Working Families Party is a nonprofit organization and they can ask any member that they want. And uh, I'm sure that Representative Tlaib will have a lot of good things to say um, about President Biden and the things we've done. Um, But I, I, I just want people to understand the progressive caucus doesn't give a Uh, a response to the president. We will all be out there talking about what we thought. And I believe that the president's gonna raise some really important progressive priorities like antitrust legislation, some of the great work he's done on antitrust. That felt like shade and distancing to me. Am I the only one? No, that that, that was definitely shade and distancing. And that is is a, a, a congressperson who was first and foremost concerned with supporting uh, her party uh, and, and her party's leader. And, and my point in saying that is not to criticize uh, uh, Pramila Jayapal on her policy positions on things, because she's been pretty good on various policy statements. Tactically, though, has that she, shows- Has she, has she, has she, she threw it out? Like, I mean, I'm saying on the, uh, in general, has she been a fairly progressive member of Congress? Yes. Fairly Ta- progressive. David, 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 you tactically, just, you put out a movie. Not been somebody, <laughs> tactically, she has not been somebody who has been willing, in my view, has not been willing to challenge her party in nearly as adequate a way as it needs to be challenged. And the, the, the lament is, is that somebody who leads the Congressional Progressive Caucus should be seeing their role as my job is not to serve uh, this or that party. Right, to say very nice leader. things about Biden. Right, that's that's not, that clip. shouldn't be her job. 
That right. should not be her job. Right. I think the, pro- the fundamental problem is, is that the differences on tactics have started to become, in my view, a difference on values. My point in saying that Pramila Jayapal has been decent on you know, t- supporting Medicare for all, at least you know, signing on to the bill, that's a values question. But the tactic question is, if you're not willing to challenge your party on those issues, then do you actually really stand for Right. And, and to that point, I would argue that no, absolutely no credit is due for giving lip service in that way if it doesn't come with a tactical follow-up. Yeah, so I you're saying in, here, in absolutely no circumstances no. does Pramila Jai, do you have to hand it to Pramila Jai? And you know what? <laughs> I, no I, 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 can, I, I can agree with you. I can, I can agree with you because here's the thing. A, a couple, a little, at the beginning of Biden's presidency, it's not that I was willing to, you know, give him a pass or whatever, but I think they were trying to figure out uh, differences in values and differences in tactics. And I think what's happened now over the course of a year, a year and a half, that the tactical differences, should we push here, should we not push there, the tactical differences have metastasized into a values difference to the point where if you're not, if you're the CPC chair and you're distancing yourself from one of your members who's talking about working families issues, and you're not willing to essentially uh, organize your caucus as a block uh, to demand things, then the tactics of that, your tactical decisions have become a values problem. It suggests that your values are secondary to your tactical loyalty to the party, regardless of what the party is doing vis-a-vis your values. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with that, David. I know that you have to run early, so I want to give you an opportunity to tell our listeners where they can find you and your work in any exciting upcoming projects. Sure, you can find our work at dailyposter.com. Thanks for, thanks for the opportunity to to chat with you. I hope folks will go see the movie. If you are a Netflix subscriber, go see the movie. Uh, don't look up. Uh, it, it, you will see the um, cinematic uh, expression of the uh, disappointment, demoralization, depression, and laments that I've, I think, uh, expressed here. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll see that in cinematic fashion with lots of, of big stars. You, you absolutely will. It's great. I can't believe it. I can't believe any listeners to, of this show haven't watched it yet, but go and keep it in, in Netflix's top 10 or whatever for a little bit longer. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. All right, Ken, I want to get your read. Now, you tend, you, you're, you're huge on Twitter. Okay. You do these gangbusters, buster tweets that get numbers that I fully cannot comprehend. And that I'm a little envious of, I'm not going to lie. So I want to hear what you made. I want to hear the, the, the verbal version of your take on the state of the union last night. Did anything surprise you? Um, I, sh- you, I share some of your you. frustration with the, you know, lack of focus uh, on, you know, climate and alternative energy, the usual critiques that we have, uh, but also the silence from the administration, because I can tell you, knowing people inside, in the intelligence agencies, in the national security portion of the government, um, they're not quiet on this stuff. They're, you know, loudly debating it and they're angry about it, uh, specifically uh, uh, the, the the Saudi-Russia thing that we were discussing mm. before. Unfortunately, this stuff doesn't spill out into the public. They've been very careful uh, not to, I think, um, provide a sort of news peg for the mainstream to start discussing these things. Mm. Uh, but it, but it's, but it's, you know, um, something that's that that people are really upset at the administration about it. At least the folks that I'm talking to. So, in, um, in what way are they upset? They're upset that Biden isn't doing more to sanction Russia's energy. Are they mad that he's doing what he is doing is contributing to high oil prices? Yeah. What? So when he, when he was running for president, when he was campaigning, uh, he said that he was going to quote make Saudi Arabia a pariah, and mm-hmm. I think that there were a lot of people inside that were sympathetic to that and wanted that and had any number of grievances. Um, go, you know, not just um, the murder of Khashoggi, but the human rights record I was describing before. The I mean. When you talk about people in the intelligence community, they're primarily interested in the great game in a lot of cases, you know, so they perhaps don't have the same interests that activists and, and people, you know, uh, concerned about concerned about sort of general issues do. But um, even like you were saying before, this is becoming a geopolitical problem um, where it is hampering things that they do care about in their portfolio. They do care about um, it, Russia expanding its influence. They do care about a new um, uh, sort of realignment where these Gulf countries and their extraordinary oil wealth is 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 uh, starting to latch on to China, starting to latch on to Russia, starting to provide them with the resources they need to pursue these deeply unpopular um, by international you know standards uh, things that they're doing. And so uh, the impression I'm getting is that uh, they're not seeing enough 
action. I mean, not talking to MBS is a whole lot shorter than Trump went. I'll give you an example. In 2020, uh, when Trump asked the Saudis to decrease production to protect the shale industry, um, they didn't do it initially. And what did he do? He threatened to pull all U.S. forces out of Saudi Arabia. Mm. Suddenly, lo and behold, MBS says, hey, I've got a change of heart. I'm willing to do it. Let's talk. You know, I'll do this. And he decreased production. That's power politics. And it's a kind of game that Biden, um, I think, and, and folks inside think is not willing to play. And they wish they would. It's difficult because, you know, of course, I, I'm I'm not trying to be in a position where I'm like, yes, be friendlier with MBS. You know, right. but it, it seems like you also can't live in a world where you want to make Saudi Arabia a pariah, you want to make Russia a pariah, and you also want to ignore a, a hard pivot to green, clean energy. Exactly. You can't it's have all three. Right. And it's the contradiction of the same sort that we were discussing with Russia, where um, you were going to see a lot more cases like what David reported earlier today, where they're not going to be able to go through with these sanctions because it's going to hurt their rich friends. And in the same way, they've got rich friends in Saudi that that um, you know a firmer line with respect to human rights would have. And yeah, you know, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, last night it makes me think of the fact that last night Bernie Sanders went on with Stephen Colbert, and Stephen Colbert kind of teed up a joke, you know, in quotation marks, a joke about you know uh, you talk a lot about uh, oligarchs and 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 you know taxing millionaires and billionaires and going after these Russians, you know. She would go after the American oligarchs too, and Bernie's like, "I mean, this is what I've been saying. I mean, like, this is this is not humor. Well, this is it's, it is all intermingled." Well, you see, they're not oligarchs here. They're they're innovators. They're job <laughs> creators. You know, we have different it's a bit of a usage difference there. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna have to insert the the very famous Jason Johnson clip where he tried to you know, argue down Nina Turner in the context of the 2020 campaign for referring to oligarchs as oligarchs. And uh, apparently a, 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 a Russia expert, <laughs> he, he insisted that that term should not be more yeah. broadly applied. I have no problem with criticizing the system, the system that allows Mike Bloomberg to make all the money that he makes, the system that allows him to buy what he wants to buy, the system that allows him to buy himself into the administration and buy himself into the debates is a problem. But to call him an oligarch, I think, is a misnomer in this environment. And again, you're working for somebody who's part of one percent. Do you call him an oligarch? No, you don't. And now we have people who are very specifically saying, no, we need to have a better understanding of that term because of how implicated American oligarchs are in all of us and, glo and oligarchs globally. Yeah. Are you suggesting that uh, the super rich here don't get there by dint of their competence? Are you saying that Elon <laughs> Musk, that his, that his tweets are somehow reflective of his internal mental state? I don't think that's possible. <laughs> I mean, we forget that just two years ago, we had the richest, one of the richest men in America, Michael Bloomberg, self-financing right. an entire presidential run. Right. And a lot of the figures that we are supposed to look at as heroes, voting rights advocates, people like um, Stacey Abrams, covered for him. You know, uh, a lot of prominent black mayors who had gone through his mayoral camp, Keisha Lance Bottoms and the like, all got up there on TV and said, hey, I think he's a good guy, completely ignoring stop and frisk, saying that this was a possibility because it was widely understood that he might be the last line of defense against a Bernie Sanders candidacy. And an oligarch, at the end of the day, to many Americans, is better than a socialist. And we're seeing that play out in a lot of these TV clips. I honestly think that tomorrow night at the State of the Union message, our president should stand up and say, we're going to build Keystone. We're going to build more my policy. Reverse it. Yep. Reverse it. Now, he won't do it, but that's what he should do in America's interests and the interests of the world. The majority of Americans would support that. Absolutely, they would. Because our gas prices would go down and all of those people who used to work for Keystone, they're out of work yes. now, would have jobs. It would signal that we're prepared to go back and produce energy that the world needs. Right. Jen Psaki is pushing renewable energy to stop the dependence on foreign oil. Shouldn't, that, shouldn't Biden say, let's produce more oil here in the U.S., then we can supply oil yes. to our allies? Yes, of course. That's what should be done now. Maybe a, a temporary hold on the Green New Deal, a temporary hold on rejecting fossil fuels, because we really need them now. And that would make the environmentalists and all the progressives happy, maybe, or at least give the, some sort of a compromise. Yeah. I will focus on that later, but right now we're in dire straits. You will never get the environmentalists to agree to using more fossil mm -hmm. fuels. Just in the short, they will never agree to it. What will he it's say religion it? on their part. Well, I think they're really insightful about the environmentalists not falling for that okey doke But I, I'm curious, 
what is the advice? What is the direction that's that you're hearing from your sources in the kind of natural, uh, um, the national security community about what they would like to see happen here, given these conflicts of interest that have emerged around the energy sector? A lot of them are pretty cynical. I mean, um, you know, there is circumstantial evidence that on some level, the Saudi government was involved in 9-11. And it's been described to me, if everyone can just, you know, look past that, how are you going to find something worse than that? You know, it's not going to mm. be <laughs> very hard. I mean, you know, in that case, that was a, you know, horrific terror attack. In this case, there's starting to be serious ge geopolitical stakes that, that, um, that are of interest to extraordinarily powerful people. So I do think the circumstances right now are a little bit different. And uh, to be honest, some of these guys are, who are not progressives by any means, you know, <laughs> my, <laughs> I spent so much of my time talking to folks that I, I, there's a lot that I don't agree on. But one thing that I'm finding more and more common ground on is exactly this. They're starting mm -hmm. to sound more like progressives that I talk to, not necessarily because they're concerned about the same things I'm concerned about, but because um, it's starting to hamper the, the great game that I was describing before. And, you know, when these guys, uh, like the clip that you just played, talk about, oh, we need this temporary... It's just a temporary solution. We can do this stuff later. They've been saying that my entire adult life. Yeah. And I was describing before the protection of the shale industry. We already have a domestic oil industry. The U.S. is the third biggest contributor behind Saudi Arabia and Russia um, of, of oil. So it's not like we have any sort of shortage of it. What's more is if you're going to, you know, put in the Keystone XL, that's going to be years until you're starting to derive any sort of benefit that, that redounds to the consumer. So it's just disingenuous, you know, and that's what I'm trying to sketch out here. With the Saudi case, they could increase production uh, and not uh, have to build an entirely new energy infrastructure that then creates an incentive to rely on it, uh, political, because they're going to create a lobbying apparatus that ensures its survival. You can just have the Saudis increase production. But again, what the guys inside are saying is that Biden is not willing to get tough, crack his knuckles, and do what President Trump did. And I, I want to, you know, stress I'm not someone that's saying we should invade a country or, or you know, even threaten them or anything like that, but just say, hey, we're going to pull back some of our weapon support. We give them, mm -hmm. we sell untold amounts in the billions of armed supplies because they don't have a sort of sophisticated military of the sort that they need to advance their interests and protect themselves from regional adversaries. So they're hugely dependent on us. So that gives us a lot of leverage that I think folks in Washington are not honest about when they say, oh, what can we do? It's just some other you know, sovereign country deciding what they want to do. What can we do? Well, we can, it, without even doing anything positive, just pull back on some of the um, support that we provide to them. And that would send a message. Uh, he's scarcely tried any of that beyond the refusal to meet with MPS. That's interesting also, because you mentioned in your article that at one point, Saudi Arabia had threatened to, you know, have a military alliance with Russia instead of the United States, but it was a little bit of a of a, a threat made in, in vain because of the lack of compatibility between Russia exactly. military technology and our own. So if we did then threaten to withdraw our military support in that way, it could very conceivably throw you know that it just that it throw Saudi Arabia into a much more severe situation than you might imagine because even if it does get Russian support, the turnover. The transfer time would be significant. Exactly. It's just like with they offer these facile arguments for doing nothing, which is essentially what he's saying, oh, you know, we can't, you know, clean energy is great. We'll just do it at some point in the future. Same way they, they say, uh, you know, uh, holding Saudi to account for its human rights record, um, you know, that's something great that we can work on in the future. We, we, we can't, we can't do it now. And, you know, I, I hear things like that and it's just, it's uh, it, it frustrates me because if you're an ordinary person, you hear that that might be persuasive. But if you talk to the folks in the military, in the intelligence community, who describe to me how difficult it is to move off of one weapon system to another, so say mm -hmm. they say they they they're constantly threat. It was described to me by one intelligence official as kind of like a bad high school relationship where they're going to mm -hmm. threaten to go with some other guy if you don't mm -hmm. shape up, kind of thing. And the reality is, there's a lot of bluffing going on in that respect. Now they're clearly working with the Russians. Um, on oil production questions, but on military and defense questions, that's a very different matter. As you were, uh, as you said a moment ago, um, when we sell them F 35s, F 16s, these, these fighter jets that they're pounding, you know, Yemen at a dust with, it's sort of like, uh, how you have an iPhone. It's not just the object, it's the software on it that needs yeah. to be maintained and updated. Those things are extraordinarily complex weapon system that what weapon systems that no one else is able to run and no one else is able to manage. Uh, besides us, why, do, why are people not hearing this reality? 
I think because, um, you know, the reality is they throw a lot of money around um, lobbying wise in DC. They have a lot of clout and there's a lot of incentive for people to say, oh, you know, we've got to just look the other way on the human rights questions. And now on the geopolitical problems, because we don't want them, we don't want to drive them into the arms of the Chinese or into the arms of whoever. Yeah. And as, as I'm saying, that's a lot harder. That's not as easy as you think. It's funny that you mentioned a bad high school relationship because I was reading your article and thinking, this is like trying to break up with someone when you share a New York City apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I wish I could be more specific about who the intelligence official is. This is like, <laughs> these are very, you know, surly tough guys. And it's funny to hear them uh, dis describe global affairs in this fashion. <laughs> well, it's, it does. I mean, look, the more that I'm learning about all of this, the more that it does feel like it's a bunch of interpersonal nonsense that makes it very dispiriting. But I do want to ask you just one follow up. Earlier, you mentioned that they're working overtime, you know, to not give folks a news hook to talk about these geopolitical concerns. And, you know, as a newsman, I'm curious what kind of hook, what what do you wish, what kind of bait do you think existed for journalists to pick up on? What would be the flag that you would want to raise for people to start covering this? Well, I think there's a nationalist case of sorts here. Should the Saudis and the Russians be able to drive up gas prices in an election year and influence mm. and you know whatever your views are i don't care if it's a republican in office or democrat should some other government i mean we spent how long talking about um election interference well what is this you know and there's historical precedent for it as you mentioned with carter um unfortunately we're not allowed to talk about this because you talk about it it quickly imperils a relationship that a lot of folks in money a lot of folks in washington are making a whole lot of money off of but i think it's an important thing to talk about if what you if you care about just democracy. I don't know how else, I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it does seem like the obvious, you know, you know, the I'm on the tarmac trying to land the plane. And then the obvious solution here is to talk about energy independence, green energy. Right, right. I mean, even I know the nuclear folks have been trying to make their case and I've heard them making their case louder than I have the green folks making their case in this moment, despite the fact that a lot of the, the issues with the time it takes to ramp up you know, plants that have been shut down, all of these other kinds of things also is not on the timeline that the moment demands, right? And still there, I see them out here, they're, they're, they're waving their flag. And it is very frustrating that green energy isn't having a moment right now, but it would be nice to hear people put to the Fox News correspondents we've listened to, many, frankly, liberal news correspondents who have been echoing similar sentiments, but who are kind of unwilling to get past the you know, you know, engage in any kind of conversation that entertains Putin or Russia as any kind of right. um, geopolitical power that one would be negotiating with. It's like, the, you, these are your choices. These right. are your choices. Energy independence, Russia, Saudi Arabia. Right. These are your options. And that if it's you binary, want to cut, yeah, it's literally. It, and, and otherwise, if, if you are a liberal who is concerned with protecting Joe Biden's good name going into an election season, I don't know how you do that and also maintain this stance that, you know, mentioning Putin, mentioning the, sorry, the geopolitical benefits of having a better relationship with Putin like Trump did, inured to his benefit at the ballot box. Right. Yeah. They want to have it both ways. And it's a contradiction at the heart of the way that the party is configured, um, you know, where they, uh, at, at the level of the base, I think that there are a lot of sincere people that do want to care about things like human rights and things. But at the very top, the you know the constituencies that that really run things that steer the ship, um, you know, their interests run in another direction. And when we talk about these kind of um, global powers, uh, it doesn't run in the direction of 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 you know these concerns about human rights. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, coming to talk with me today. I, you gave me some clarity, which is always what I'm looking for in these moments. Can you tell our listeners, who I'm sure are familiar with you already, where to find you on the internet and where to find your work? Well, I'm at Ken Klippenstein. I don't think there are any other Ken Klippensteins on uh, Twitter. And if you're a federal official, particularly in the national security world, you can uh, shoot me a signal message at 202-510-1268. Leak to Ken, everybody. Leak to everybody, Ken. Everybody, leak to Ken. <laughs> you should Can't get t-shirts made. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kim, thank you very much. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to another episode. This is, of course, a free episode. You can get an extra episode of Bad Faith Podcast every week on Mondays if you subscribe at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. Really appreciate your support and it enables us to keep doing reporting like the kind you just listened to. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. Remember, you can also watch these episodes on Bad Faith YouTube. We appreciate a like and a subscription that's free on YouTube. And as always, take care. 
and keep the faith. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith. Thank you.